just on size, cichlids vary enormously. The dwarf cichlid there is about just one inch in size, full grown, whereas the pike cichlid, as I mentioned before, grows up to about three foot in length, a yard, a metre. What distinguishes cichlids is two things in particular. They have an incredible variety of jaws and teeth. Uh, unlike most fish, they don't seem to just have the normal jaws with their teeth. They have plates in their throat, pharyngeal plates, which are not fixed but are movable. So in effect, they have two sets of draw, jaws, a front set with teeth and a back set with teeth. And between the two of them, that gives enormous versatility. And cichlids have adapted a phenomenal variety of diets. And here's a particular fish, I think it's one of the tilapias. And you see how it's grazing the algae off rock. And so it's got those chisel-shaped teeth, which can quickly remove the the algae, where something like cichla, predators, chasing fast-moving fish, has got those very pointed teeth with which to grab and hold prey. Um, but you find among cichlids a tremendous diversity. Here are those from Lake Malawi in Africa. Uh, there are fish with the jaws and teeth adapted for eating fish scales and fins, for baby fish and eggs, for mollusks, for eating small fish, eating insect larvae, and so on and so on and so on. Tremendous variety. In fact, uh, one scholar uh, wrote that the variety of teeth in cichlids is so enormous, it dwarfs practically the whole of the existing vertebrate variation in teeth. You find enormous variety in just this one family of fish. And if it wasn't that we know otherwise, these different cichlids would be put in a vast array of different families, so different are their teeth and jaw structures. And yet, they so clearly belong as just one family. In reproduction, some of the fish are substrate brood. That means they uh, lay uh, lots of eggs, usually hundreds, on a surface, uh, which may be just simply uh, the top of a flat rock, but, or some like to hang their eggs in, on the roof of caves. And so in fish tanks, if you provide them with a flower pot, they'll lay their eggs on the roof of the inside. Others are mouth brooding. That is, the eggs are laid, and the female usually, but sometimes the male, will take the eggs into their mouth to brood them and keep them safe. And even the, the young will be kept in the mouth if there's any danger of threatening as well. Incredible behaviour, these fish, nothing like goldfish. And then thirdly, there's a, a sort of an in-between variety where some of them will lay their eggs, but when they hatch they then take the young into their mouths to keep them safe until they're uh, well grown. And so just to pitch it, those are those convict cichlids again, shown uh, substrate broods at that point looking after their young which are swimming around them. And then the mouth brooders. Um, at the top you've got the, the flock of young fish, uh, the mother's calling them to her. Middle pitch, you see them squeezing into the mother's mouth to get away from the danger. And then the bottom, you just got a picture of the, uh, the mouth very cleverly taken when she was breathing, showing all the young crammed into the mouth inside. Very interesting to think about how that kind of behaviour involved. Remembering these are fish that eat small fish. And here they are, bro uh, brooding safe with the, the egg and youngs in their mouths. So fantastic behaviour, fascinating fish. Then you keep tropical fish. No cichlid keepers here. Oh, you're missing something. You're really missing something. And they don't, they don't make messes like cats and dogs. They don't ruin your furniture. <laughs> and yes, as I say, they're absolutely fascinating. And evolution action, because particularly in Africa, most of the great lakes of Africa have huge numbers of these cichlid fish. We're just incredible variety and variation. Often what are called species flocks, where you get large numbers of these fish swimming together, not just one species, but lots of species, all mixed together in incredible variety and profusion. And, you know, surely this is evolution in action. But, 
two fishes. On the left hand side you've got the fishes, or cichlids from Lake Tanganyika and the other side from Lake Malawi and just shown in both lakes independently you've got very similar species which match each other in their varieties and adaptations. That leads me on to the, the points I want to make. On the face of it, that looks like you know incredible adaptive variation, evolution in action, all the rest of it. But two things to say against that. The first is the fact that if evolution is true, the one thing you'd expect as a, a naturalist, in a sense here of one who's looking at animals and plants in the wild, you'd expect that as you increase your experience of any particular group of animals or plants, that you'd expect the, the boundaries to, to, to start to become blurred and that you would not find distinctiveness. It's exactly what Darwin expected. He expected that as you investigated nature, so you would find that the boundaries are blurred and that all species eventually uh, merge into others because surely they've evolved. And if all the links in that chain of life were there, you would not be able to uh, make sharp distinctions. And yet the fact is, and I found this is true when I, obviously when I talked to other scholars, when I read the literature, that every botanist, every zoologist who has ever investigated any group in depth has always found the same thing. That the more they investigate a group, the more they find that their awareness of it becomes more and more distinct. And they don't find any difficulty in distinguishing their particular group of animals or plants from the neighbouring groups. They just do not find blurred boundaries. They find distinct kinds. And that's some which I think probably is very much missing today because although you know, there are probably more biologists in the world today than there have ever been, yet of course most of those biologists are actually varieties of geneticists or particularly of chemists and biochemists. Not many biologists today, a very small proportion, actually work in the wild with living animals and plants. And so that experience, which was so common in the previous generations, is not so well known today. And um, I'll show you this particular fish because I, I found that after working with these cichlids for a, a couple of years, I could go into a pet shop anywhere and just catch a glance out the corner of my eye of a fish and know instantly whether or not it was a cichlid. And I particularly had this print with this particular fish. It's a fish called Etroplus. It's the variety of cichlid found in Sri Lanka, which is perhaps the most different kind of cichlid there is. And I'd never seen this fish, but I went into a pet shop in, in Birmingham that I hadn't been in before, and they had a, a large number of aquaria and tropical fish. And just at the core of my eye, I saw this fish. And I don't know how to this day, but I knew instantly that is a cichlid. And uh, again, talking to other scientists, women, other groups of animals, they have exactly the same experience. If you ask them to write down a paper how it is they know that an animal is a member of the group of their investigation, they just probably won't be able to tell you. Yet somehow there's something holistic about it that shouts cichlid, or wherever the group happens to be. And that was, that was my experience. I could just infallibly tell what was a cichlid and what wasn't. Just from a glance, from yards away in a tank, I knew. But the other thing, the much more important thing, was to find that the more I investigate the cichlids, and what I did was actually keep as many species as I possibly could and then ransack the literature and start to tabulate all the different varieties and characteristics that the cichlids have and their distribution. And what I found throughout this group was mosaic patterns of variation. That is, all the tremendous variety, those 2,000 odd species, were actually created out of a relatively small number of character states. In other words, there are only about four different colour pigments found in cichlids. There are only about 12 basic patterns in which those pigments were distributed. But those 12 patterns and four colours, of course, give endless permutations. And that's essentially what you found amongst the cichlids. They just endlessly permutate those colours and those patterns in different ways. What looked like an incredible profusion was actually built on a relatively small amount of variation. 
And what is more, the same pattern.